Okay, now that we've examined how language has changed and how it's always going to change, let's talk a little bit more about the type of change that is occurring and who is governing that and who isn't governing that and what role linguists play in that. So um, if we were in class, I would pose this question. So just go ahead and answer in your head. Um, which one is correct? Okay, of the examples below, which one is more correct? A, she doesn't know him. B, she don't know him or C, they are both acceptable. I'm guessing the majority of you would say, well, if we're talking about correctness, A is more correct. She doesn't know him. Um, and some of you might be thinking, well, I've heard B used, right? She don't know him. Um, but even though people use it, it's not necessarily correct. Um, so we want to discuss that opinion right there. Which one is more correct? Is there a real answer for which one's more correct? Um, does B have some validity because there's a group of speakers who actually will use that structure? Um, so we want to talk about um, those things. Um, we're going to do that by looking at um, prescriptivism versus descriptivism. Now, these words can be tricky because they sound super similar, but their meanings are complete opposites. So we'll break it down slowly. Um, so whether or not you thought A, she doesn't know him was correct, or B, she don't know him was correct, or if you thought C, they both are acceptable, they both are correct, makes a difference on whether you're more of a prescriptivist or a descriptivist. Um, and we're going to dissect these two words to help you make meaning of them, okay? As linguists, we're always going to dissect the word so that you can um, figure out what they mean. A prescriptivist um, is kind of like a doctor, okay? Think of the word prescribe. We're dissecting the word prescriptive, and out of that, we can get the word prescribe. And so what does a doctor do when they prescribe? Well, you go to a doctor because you're sick, right? There's something wrong with you. And a doctor says, I can make that better. If I prescribe this to you and you take this, um, then you will be better. And that's what a prescriptivist linguist does. They look at language as rules and structures, and they decide what is acceptable or unacceptable. And they say, okay, you're using this part of English wrong. Here's the prescribed rule that you should follow and you will speak English better. That is what a prescriptivist does. Um, some of you are reading that going, well, that makes a lot of sense. And some of you are reading that going, um, well, that sounds wrong, right? Who should be able to tell me what's right or wrong? The reality is there are good places for prescriptivism and there may be some negative places. So we'll discuss those in a second. But remember, a prescriptivist says there are rules and structures to a language that we need to follow so that we can speak the language at its best, okay? A descriptivist, on the other hand, is more probably the stance a linguist would take. Um, we look at language and how it's used and we describe that used. So um, we notice that some people say she doesn't know him and this other group of people might say she don't know him and we dissect what groups say what and why they say that and how that fits into the rich tapestry of their own dialect and we simply describe it. We observe and report. Okay, we're not setting boundaries on what is correct or incorrect, but we're just we're just observing how it's used and how people um, follow the own structures within their own dialect, um, because we believe all languages are rule driven. So there are two different approaches, prescriptivism and descriptivism. Okay, prescriptivists tend to focus more on written language, while descriptivists will focus uh, will observe spoken language. Let's dive into that. Prescriptivists are people who say, here are the rules and structures you have to follow to speak or use English at its best, okay? There's a reason they have focused on written language, and that's because it is easier to control, okay? So we have things like the APA style manual on how to write. You take grammar courses um, throughout your entire um, education, right? There are systems in place to help control how you write. It is an easier system to govern. So prescriptivists have been able to control written language uh, a lot easier, unlike spoken language. Um, spoken language changes all the time. When you just watch that history of English, what was changing the most over time was the spoken delivery of the language. Spelling has changed some, written language, spelling has changed some as well. But when we get into orthography, in uh, chapter three, you'll see that we have some spelling conventions that are 1500 years old. It changed, but not as much as spoken language has changed. 
um, which is why when you were able to read the Lord's Prayer, you might have identified more words than you could understand when you were listening to it. And speech and writing are very different, okay? So speech is a lot older. We're not talking about English speech. We're just talking about language in general. Language is a lot older than writing, okay? Um, the uh, All languages have spoken forms. Every known language in the world has an oral form, but not all language languages have written forms. Um, you will learn language orally naturally. You have to be taught how to read and write. Um, so speech and written language are very different. One of the reasons why um, prescriptivists, uh, linguists especially, are more interested in speech than writing is because it does change a lot. And there's so many variants. Versus writing has a consistent structure, right? And we're talking about uh, professional writing, um, not just uh, necessarily like someone's Twitter feed, right? You can, people will be very uh, dialect heavy in their um in their own like personal Facebook postings, whatever, we're talking about conventional writing style because we all know that there is one and you're using it every day when you're in class. So again, now knowing that we have two different perspectives, prescriptivism, the people who say, here's the rules and structures and descriptivism, here's how people use the language, which one is correct? So a prescriptivist would say, A, A is correct. She doesn't know him. Um, because it's following the rule of the pronoun, and we'll talk about that in a second too. A descriptivist would say, C, they both are acceptable, okay? Because it's acceptable in whatever dialect says that's how we use it. Um, but so it begs the question, prescriptivism, descriptivism, how do they exist today, okay? So how do we, how do we see these two theories around us right now? Well, let's start with your K through 12 English classes. Are these classes prescriptive? meaning they're showing you rules and structure, or are they descriptive, where they're letting you kind of free write and not really controlling what, um, what your product or your writing is. Um, the, the reality is they are prescriptive, right? That's part of the prescriptive system in terms of how they control writing, right? Is they we've built into our education system, we need to teach these rules and structures to make these kiddos, these students, um, better at using the appropriate standard English in the future. Um, linguists, I've already shared with you, they're descriptive. We're not going to tell you what rules to follow. We're just going to tell you what rules people are following. And that might be describing a dialect of English that people don't think sounds correct. And that might be describing some standard um, dialects where people think that looks more formal. Doesn't matter. We're just telling you, hey, this group talks like this. This group talks like this. And they're all following rules. This is really interesting. Um, dictionaries, are these prescriptive or descriptive? Are these telling you the rules of how to use a word or are they telling you how a word is used? It's kind of a trick question. Most of you would be shocked to find out that um, dictionaries are descriptive, that they actually are just showing you the words that are used in English and how people are using them. Um, there's a whole system for how they come up with this, but I'm telling you the system is descriptive. They're basically looking at what we're using, how we're using it, and they're putting it in the dictionary to define it for us. Um, However, there's a little bit of prescriptivism in there in the fact that there's also gatekeepers who decide what can go in the dictionary and when. Um, a good example of that would be the word ain't. Ain't. He ain't going. Okay. Ain't. Ain't is a word. We use that word. It has a meaning. It means is not. Right. Um, and that word existed in English for, uh, I believe, 100 years, 50 plus years before the dictionaries would ever list it. So, Base, if a dictionary is fully descriptive, they should have put that word in early on, but they didn't because the prescriptivist side was they didn't like the word, so they didn't want to put it in the dictionary. It's a little bit of a trick question, but at the root of it, dictionaries are supposed to be descriptive. They're supposed to define things the way that they um, are used by speakers like you and me. Um, let's look, though, some of you might be going, oh, I'm definitely a prescriptivist. I adhere to the rules and structure, and if I'm not, I want someone to correct me. And some of you are like, I hate that stuff. I'm a descriptivist. I'm very interested in how people have their own rules and their own dialects. Um, but I want to show you it's a little more complicated than you being on one side or the other. Um, here's the English pronoun system. You might maybe have not seen it in a chart like this, but you know this stuff, right? I went to the store. You went to the store. He, she, it went to the store. We went to the store. 
You went to the store, meaning plural people, right? They went to the store. Awesome. Those are your subject pronouns. We're going to learn more about subject, not object pronouns and syntax. You're not going to memorize this right now, and that's fine, but you will know this before the end of the semester. Then we have object pronouns. He went to the store with me. He went, um, I went to the store with you. Uh, she went to the store with him, her, it, okay? We have a way that we use these, and no one really taught you that you when you were learning the language if you learned english as a first language or learned it as a child you probably weren't ever taught this but you know how this works okay this is something ingrained in your brain that no one put in a far, uh, put in a sheet like this or a grid for you but you have it memorized and you know how to use these pronoun systems okay i don't think any of you arguing with me here that i've never never heard of these pronouns before no i think the argument is that you know them okay so let's look a little closer at these. Um, we could use each of these in a short sentence. I just did them on the last screen, so let's move on from there. Um, but you know that something is ungrammatical when someone's using one of those pronouns wrong. So I warned him. That's grammatical, meaning it sounds correct, right? It's following the prescriptivist rules. But he warned me is also correct. What about I warned he? I warned he. No, you're thinking that's not right. It needs to be, I warned him. Um, he warned I. Uh, that doesn't sound right. That sounds ungrammatical as well. Me warned him. Him warned me, okay? Um, now, you, you're able to hear those and go, yes, yeah, some of these don't sound right. They're ungrammatical, and a few of them sound correct, so those are grammatical. Um, and, well, the subject and object pronouns, you are the same. You warned me. I warned you. Okay, you can see that on the chart. One of the things that makes English a little tricky to learn, there's a little rule right there, right? Um, but you were, you're able to distinguish from looking at these, which ones don't sound correct and which ones sound correct, okay? Um, but let's, so you might think, yeah, I'm a prescriptivist. I can follow these rules. But let's get into some more complicated scenarios. A speaker says to a group of people, who wants coffee? Three people in the group say, me. Why didn't they say I for I want coffee? Because you'd never say me want coffee. So why do they respond with me? Because technically it might be I want coffee. All right. Um, but most of you, I imagine, would say me, me, me instead of I, I, I. OK, so here's some here's a situation where if you think you're following the rules, but you would say me, it seems like you're maybe not following the rule. A father says to his children, which one of you broke the lamp? The youngest boy says, it was I, father, I broke the lamp. Is this young child prescriptively correct? Which is better in your opinion? It was me, dad, or it was I, dad, okay? Well, the rule would be that it should say it was me because me is an object pronoun. Again, you might not understand what I'm saying about subject and object yet, but technically the rule would be, you would say it was me, dad, but it was I, father, or it was I, dad, could make some sense, um, but it's not following the rule. This, these two get a little hard. I wish we were in class together because you'll see a divide. Me and Andy played baseball yesterday. Is this right or wrong? Me and Andy played baseball yesterday. Well, sometimes students tell me this is correct. Some, a handful of students will say this is correct. Some will say, no, it's Andy and me played baseball yesterday. So they want to reverse the two, but that's not the problem either. It should be Andy and I played baseball yesterday, right? You wouldn't say me played baseball yesterday. If you took out the name Andy completely, just say you played baseball. You wouldn't say me played baseball yesterday. You would say I played baseball yesterday. So therefore, it'd be Andy and I played baseball yesterday. Uh, what about the second one? Thanks for inviting my wife and I to eat at your house. Is this correct? And here, most of you would say, yes, it sounds correct, right? Thanks for inviting my wife and I to eat at your house. Perfectly acceptable oral communication. The meaning's there. It's not confusing, but it's not grammatically correct. You wouldn't say, thanks for inviting I to eat at your house tonight. You would say, thanks for inviting me to eat at your house tonight. It should be me, an object pronoun. So thanks for inviting my wife and me to eat at your house tonight. Not thanks for inviting my wife and I to eat at your house tonight. So you see where it gets a little more complicated because there's certain structures we are so used to using that aren't correct. That prescriptivist would say you're, you're not using the correct grammatical structure. And you'll see that some of you who felt maybe very confident about, well, I know how to use these pronouns, you, enter, you maybe encountered, I guarantee, you encountered maybe at least one situation here that, that you maybe didn't use the correct pronoun in.
So prescriptivists say this is wrong because if you take Andy away, you would not say me played baseball yesterday. We just covered that. Um, you would not say thanks for inviting I to eat at your house tonight. You'd say thanks for inviting me to eat at your house tonight. Um, so this all has to do with the subject object um, uh, grammatical structure of English, which is something we'll explore in, um, in our syntax chapter later on. But keep it in mind for now. Um, so then we've got another example here. Which of the following combinations do you tend to use? Which of them seems correct and which of them seems like it's the oldest um, form? So between you and I, between you and me, between me and you. Um, very few people ever tell me they use the last one. I usually get the first two. So which one do you think is more grammatically correct? Between you and I, typically, um, we, we know we've done studies on this, um, the middle, a middle-aged person, someone with a college degree, um, and people will use this to show politeness. Between you and I, between you and I. Between you and me is the older one, the older version, and it is actually the correct one. Okay, but most people want to hyper correct and say between you and I. It is actually grammatically, prescriptivists will tell you it's between you and me. Okay, but most of us, most people use between you and I. Um, then there's between me and you, which younger people might use. Um, it's considered vernacular speech, so it's considered a dialect, right? It's just a variation. It's not considered standard English because it's not following the rule, which is between you and me. Um, so between you and I, 80 million people, um, typically, this is the most searched version, okay? So, and which was older, they're all equally old. So I said the one was older, but I meant to say it was used by an older population. All three of these have existed for about the same amount of time, okay? All three variations. So why is one correct and the other two not correct? Why is that the case? Who makes the rules? Who decided that between you and um, me was the correct standard version and that was following the rules and the other two, even though they've existed just as long, are not following the rules? Who would that be? Okay, um, and that's what we're seeking to answer um, here in section 1.4. Um, I do wanna, as we wrap up this quick section, I want you to think about how you would apply descriptive, um, descriptive linguistics to your teaching. Um, at the elementary school level. Me meaning this, when we talked about prescriptivism, we were saying here are um, rules that we want to teach people so they'll follow them so they will use the language um, at its best potential. You could say more correct, right? I put quotes around that because we don't really view one language as more correct, which we're about to get into. Um, but how would you apply descriptivism in the classroom, knowing that your students are coming in from multiple dialects of English? They're learning slang English and all these different, um, she don't know him outside the classroom, but they're coming into the classroom and they're being taught, here's how you should use the language. And this is the right way. So you need to be thinking about what opportunities do I have to apply descriptivist approach to my classroom? Um, so with that said, if all languages change all the time, what should I do with students in my classroom who use bad grammar, who don't use prescriptivist rules, right? The structure and rules. Am I wrong to give my students a lower grade for not using proper or academic English? Um, the reality is I don't have an answer for you, but there are things for you to think about and they're kind of ethical questions. As as we're looking at the sociolinguistic, these sociolinguistic topics, we're talking about some ethical issues. Um, so these are some scenarios you might find yourself in when you're teaching down the road. Um, this ends this lecture right here. I want you to move on to one point, the 1 1.4 video. We'll keep exploring this concept of prescriptivism and descriptivism, but specifically who makes the rules on what the structure is, on how we're supposed to be talking. What is that conversation um, and uh, how do we handle standard American English, um, that perspective of standard American English in our